All right, let's go ahead and kick things off. Uh, so thank you so much everyone for tuning in today for our webinar with Aero Electronics, Common Pitfalls to Avoid When Choosing a Contract Manufacturer. I'm Brittany Nelson, Partnerships Manager at Indiegogo. And here with me today is Taylor Johnson, Manufacturing Expert at Aero. Before Taylor gets started, I wanted to share a quick note about the Aero Certification Program with you guys, which is Aero and Indiegogo's initiative to help you with prototyping, sourcing components, manufacturing challenges, and other important steps before and after your crowdfunding campaign. The program is 100% free and offers benefits like one-on-one -on -one engineering reviews and manufacturing consultations with their team of experts like Taylor, uh, as well as discounts on components from Aero.com. A quick note about our presentation today. If you have any questions uh, while Taylor is speaking, please uh, type them at the bottom using the Q&A button uh, and we will try to address them at the end. All right, without further ado, Taylor, why don't we get started? Thanks so much, Brittany. Hi everyone, my name is Taylor Johnson. Um, I've been with Aero for about four years now. My first three years I spent as an industrial engineer at a production facility we have in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, but the past year and some change, I've been working and running our prototyping and on-demand manufacturing group. And I am based out of Central Texas. So kind of to give you a high level of what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to touch on Aero's rapid prototyping and on-demand manufacturing services, which is what I run, just to give you an idea of what I handle and the world I live in. Um, and then we're going to jump into a, a product's typical life cycle, knowing when you're ready to select a CM, design files that I see are commonly needed, um, the common criteria to consider for CMs, and as well as some common obstacles that you may run into. And then we'll get into some Q&A at the end. So a high level of Arrow's rapid prototype and on-demand manufacturing, and I think what a lot of steps that are steps that a lot of products take in the first the first, you know, bits of before you get into run rate production. So it's proof of concepting. Um, if there is, if you don't have the ability to do proof of concepting in house or have engineers that can handle that, um, we work with partners that are able to support off the shelf bombs as well as some quick turn, you know, 3D printing, CNC machining, um, and casting for those your um, enclosures and mechanical assemblies. Um, this allows you to proof out your whole concept, make sure that things work the way they're supposed to before you get into actual board level prototyping. This step isn't for everyone, um, but it definitely is, you know, it's an important step for some projects. And if you're not able to do it in-house, it's something that most CMs can, most quick turn CMs can support as well as Arrow as well. So we also have our quick turn PCB assembly and a quick turn box builds. Um, the only difference between the two is that a box build is that full assembly um, versus just the PCBA. So you can use these for prototyping or for first steps of production if you need things quickly. Um, everything that I do is domestically sourced and since I'm in the US, that's here in the US for me. Um, and this also provides some design for manufacturing and assembling as outputs of this to be able to take on to your production CM, um, to be able to learn from the issues that arose during prototyping. Um, and then for those box build again, those complex electromechanical assemblies are supported or simple. Um, assemblies are supported through that. And then finally, we have what we call on-demand manufacturing. This is our low to mid-volume PCB assembly and box build. Um, again, this is just Arrow's turn, uh, term for that low to mid-volume. Um, but in my opinion, production is production. So if 100 units is production for you, that's considered production. Um, but this is just how Arrow supports it. Um, and we also can support shelf-ready packaging and finished goods inventory. Um, I can support it through the life of that product, or if it continues to grow, we have a run rate production group that can support it once it gets to a certain volume and a cadence of, and a forecasted cadence, right? So that's where that on-demand comes in that maybe you do need some high volumes, but you just need them now and you don't know when you're gonna need your next batch, right? So enough about Arrow. Um, I wanna get into a general products life cycle, and we're gonna start at that create phase. I'm you know, sure most of you guys are very familiar with this first part of this, this cycle, um, and that's the ideation phase. Um, and that's what I like to call your back of the napkin, right? So this is where you have this great idea, you don't necessarily know how to make it happen yet, but it's the start of this whole process, right? And that's when you get into the design and that design is how. How do we make this work? 
what are the steps we need to go through to, you know, pledge this out. The design's going to have multiple iterations, most likely, right? Then you need to get into past electronic side. Is there software design? Is there enclosure design? Things like that, right? So I'm sure most of you are very, very familiar with these, these first two steps. Um, and then that new product introduction is kind of where I live. And those are those prototypes. Um, those are making sure that those work. Those are either proof of concepts, then prototyping the PCBAs and the full box build. Um, one note that I will make sure kind of just throw out there is if you are prototyping your enclosures, make sure your design is complete before you get tooling. If that means you've got to pay more to go get things 3D printed. I highly recommend that because tooling is going to be more expensive if you have to then scrap that tooling and start all over or have a new design. So that's my little tidbit there. Um, so that's where, you know, at the end of this create phase, you should come out with a design that you know works, you know does what you want it to do, and you're ready to go to market with that design, right? So then we get into make. And this is where I normally start off with low volume things. Obviously it depends product by product, how many you've already sold, what you think you're gonna be able to sell. Um, but this is where we, we use a, a contract manufacturer to do that integration, to do that production and fulfillment for us, right? And so this is where, this is a little more hands-on because a lot of times you've gotta go through a first article process, make, think, make sure things are coming out the way that you intend them to come out before you pull the trigger on building thousands of units, right? You also have in this stage your routes to market. This is definitely not my area of expertise, but it is a crucial step because without those routes to market, you're not going to have, you know, a market to sell to, right? So you need to make sure that you're also taking into account how you're going to get this product out there and what that's going to look like, right? Once you have all of that, your product is in the market, you're selling product. Now you just have to get into the manage phase. Right, so this is the management and maintenance of your product. So that's looking at end of life products or end of life components. It's looking at maybe small feedback that, you, that you've gotten on your product that you can make a small change that's not a, des a full design change to address that, right? Now you're just managing and maintaining. You're probably doing some engineering changes um, that again are not affecting the total design. And you're also looking at how to extend that product life. So if a major part is gonna be going out of uh, end of life, how do you address that, right? So you're not, you don't get to just be hands off at this point, but it is more of a maintenance phase instead of being way hands on and trying to get things built right away. And then you end up back where you started with your next generation potentially, right? You're a little farther ahead than you were initially in ideation because you're not on the back of a napkin, you've got a better starting point. Um, but you now we're looking at how do I make this into a Gen 2? How do we make maybe accessories for this, right? So you kind of always are going to be going around in this circle. You're probably going to have this for multiple products potentially, um, but it, that's why we have it in a circle and not a straight line because you're going to start all over again and now make your product that much better, right? So I kind of wanted just to go over this to kind of show the full full life cycle as well as what you're kind of responsible for and then how when a CM kind of comes into that and we'll, we'll discuss that on the next slide. So knowing when you're ready to select a CM, so there's no one size fits all approach when selecting a CM. It's gonna be completely dependent on your product, completely dependent on you and your team, and also completely dependent on the CM. So I've got some just general advice and guidelines for knowing when you're ready. Um, but there's a lot of kind of exceptions to, to all of this. So just please take, take that into account. Also, these are just based off my experiences. For certain CMs, there might be other things they need to, in order to engage, or what I tell you might be too much for what they need. So really make sure that when you are talking to a CM, you're understanding what they need and understand that it's gonna be probably different from every other CM you talk to because they all have their own way of doing business. Right, so first I'm gonna start off with design. So your design should be close to complete before engaging with the CM. The big but here is unless you're engaging with that CM to help with design work. Certain contract manufacturers also have a design arm that can help you finish maybe that final 20% of your design or help you design the full thing. So if that's what you're looking for, you might need to engage some, someone a lot sooner versus if you had gone 
to an engineering firm to do your design work, if you're doing it yourself or if you have someone on your team, right? So moving forward with, you're not going there to help with design work, right? Um, your design should be close to complete. So, and I'm gonna go through kind of the commonly needed files on the next slide, but the bulk of those files should be done. There can be some small tweaks, maybe some resistor changes, things that don't change the overall design. Um, however, every little change you make, it takes time. It's gonna drive a requote, it's gonna drive, you know, a lot of time. So that's why I suggest being really confident in that design before you're ready to go and get those quotes. Um, for example, one of my contract manufacturers I work with, um, it takes about two weeks for them to quote something, full turnkey, so all of the parts, right? And let's say they come back with their quote and I go, oh, um, we're actually, we're gonna use an alternate on reference designated U5, for example. It's now gonna take them at least two days to go return that quote, because they're not just gonna flip that part out, they actually have to go through the whole thing again to make sure parts are still in stock, make sure all of that's happening. Now, this is for, you know, some quick turn low volume stuff. And again, I have other CMs that don't take this long, but just understand that it might seem like a small change on your end, but it could also, but it could be a large time consuming process on the CM side. So make sure you understand what that looks like. And that's why I say making sure that you feel like your design is close to done is important. Things happen, designs can change. Something that you didn't expect to happen comes up. That's life, right? But going in with the expectation that it's, that it's almost done is the right way to go about it in my opinion. So finances. This can be a tricky one because you might not know how much money you need to raise without going and getting the quote first, right? So if you don't have funding already and you need to understand how much funding you need to go get, right? It's a little bit of the chicken and the egg. Um, I just recommend being very upfront with that CM and saying, hey, I need some budgetary costing to go ahead and go finish capturing my funding. Um, that way they know that they don't need to look for in-stock parts. They can give you maybe parts that are longer lead times that maybe are cheaper, um, or they don't have to try to go hunt down what parts they can find in stock right now versus parts that are gonna be in stock when you're ready. It also just lets them know that they shouldn't be expecting you to place a production order immediately following you getting that, that, um, that quote, right? Because you now need to go and do some more things on your end before you're gonna be ready for that. Most CMs are really gonna appreciate that upfrontness because they still wanna capture your business, but it just lets them know that they should be expecting that business right away. And it kind of builds that, le that level of trust between you two pretty early on. So lastly is timing. So engaging with a CM partner takes time and it's gonna vary per by CM how much time something like that takes. But for example, here's kind of some things that go into that full engagement, right? So you have quoting time. That can be, depending on some CMs, as fast as, you know, four to five days, or it can be a month, depending on your project, right? And all, your complexity, the CM's capacity, things like that. You also need time to visit the facility if possible. Um, if you're, this is your first time engaging with that CM. Now, granted, that's before COVID and kind of before our, our kind of current climate, right? But just time to understand it and really vet out the facility, right? You also need time to engage in contracts. You need to be able to, you don't wanna be rushed to sign a contract that you haven't been able to go through fully. Um, and also setting up accounts and maybe getting a line of credit with that CM, if that's something that you're able to do. So for that setting up accounts and credit, I only really know the arrow side, and I know that it can take weeks potentially. Um, and that's if there really isn't any snags or we don't hit any bumps in the road. So I just say all this to make sure that you're taking all of this time into account when you're looking at your, you know, when you should be ready for production. So this is where maybe engaging and finding a CM earlier on and being able to fill out contracts and have that account ready. And that way, when you're ready to place your order, you don't have to worry about those steps at that point, right? So next, we're gonna go to design files that are commonly needed. Um, and I've got them broken down by PCB assembly and the full product build. Um, so the only difference is the full product build will have everything in the PCB assembly plus what's under it, right? 
So you're going to need an electronics bomb with a rev number. I cannot emphasize enough how, much, how important keeping up on your revisions are. It makes sure that you and the CM are on the same page, that things are going to be built properly, um, and that there's no confusion on what's the right document package. I also recommend, I recommend having the rev number in the document somewhere and also in the title just so it's really easy to see and anytime there's even a small change you need to rev it up. It might sound tedious but it can save you in the long run. So this bomb needs to include the manufacturer and the manufacturing part number. Again this is for me, I know some CMs that can quote without those for things like resistors and capacitors. I recommend having them so you know exactly what you're getting. Um, but making sure that, you know, everything that is very specific to your bomb or to your product has a manufacturing and manufacturing part number and alternates, if you have alternates already tested out, is very helpful but not needed, right? You also need to make sure you include the bare PCB board with the rev number and it can be on a completely different rev than your total bomb rev, right? So this is where it's important to make sure that you're keeping all of everything revved separately, right? So if you've only on rev three of your PCB, you might be on rev eight of your electronics bomb, right? So make sure that you're just keeping those up and that you also have the rev number of that PCB on the bomb. That way there's no confusion on what PCB needs to be used when they're building that product. Also, just know any supplied parts that you're gonna provide as well as any do not populate parts um, or if there's something specific you wanna call out, just make sure it's called out on the bomb itself I also like to call things out in my request specifically to contract manufacturers just so I know they see it. But if it's in the document, that's the best place for it because that's what they're gonna be working off of. They're not gonna be working off your, an email, right? You also need PCB assembly drawings. These are your fab drawings and your Gerbers. Some CMs, again, are able to, you know, if, if you're in a budgetary phase, maybe assume some basic sizes, materials, things like that. However, once you actually get specific and you go to get that quoted, you might be surprised at the costs, right? So I recommend having all of that done so you have a, the best understanding of the cost as possible. Anytime that there's assumptions needed, you run a really high risk for getting a cost later on that you weren't expecting. Also, any test information. I typically don't see test information for prototyping because normally the customer is gonna do the testing themselves, but for your production, or if you have tests for your prototypes that you want, make sure you include any of that and include the time that you think that test takes. Especially if it's not a standard test, that CM is really gonna rely on that time to quote it for you, okay? Um, also note if there's special equipment needed for that test and make sure you understand who's responsible for providing that, um, if it's included in your quote or if you're responsible for providing it yourself. And if there's any special qualification tests that are needed uh, basically anything that's outside of the normal assembly that's needed um, as far as tests make sure you include as much of information as, that you have on it if you don't necessarily have the specifics but you know it's about a five minute test you can also give them that information and they'll quote based on that and as long as it's within that five minutes you should be okay um, but if it goes more than that your cost is going to increase right and then any other instructions so is there conformal coding is there device programming is there any workmanship standards that you need or medical certifications, automotive standards? What else do you need this product to be? Again, I try to give the most information possible. And then if something isn't really needed by the CM, they can ignore it versus the opposite of them needing some sort of information and I don't give it to them. Okay, so that's it for the PCBA. Now all of that is gonna go into the full product build, but so you're gonna have a top level bomb. And this is gonna have your plastics and extrusions, your hardware, your PCBA with the proper rev number, anything else that goes in that top level enclosure, you're gonna have on this top level bomb. Okay, and you also need an assembly drawing and assembly instructions. So this is gonna be instructions for mounting any boards, closing the assemblies, applying any adhesives, things like that. So you need to go through and really document out the steps this takes because this is probably gonna be pretty unique to your product and the CM's not really gonna have a way to quote that without very specific instructions from you. And that way you also make sure that it's built correctly to what you need, right? If you kind of just go, hey, yeah, slap it all together, you could end up with a loose PCB, PCBA rattling around. It could not be up to what you want, but you didn't give enough instruction for it to be built properly, right? 
And then if there is any packaging, individual packaging required, most CMs will quote bulk packaging standard. Um, but if you want it in customer facing packaging, um, if it's maybe gonna be shipped directly to an Amazon or a customer directly, um, you're gonna want any of that, right? With your, with your name on it, with your logos on it, with work instructions in it, things like that. So make sure you just have all of that information. If you have you know, any drawing, label art, packaging material, any inserts, if you're gonna have a certain number of box per cartons, if you need serial numbers, kind of understand what your packaging looks like. If you just need it in bulk packaging, that's what the CM's gonna quote standard, but if you need it in something customer facing, make sure you have that information. Give me one second, I'm gonna take a quick sip of water. Okay, so next we're gonna get into the common CM criteria to consider. So, oopsie, I'm sorry. Okay, so you need to understand what type of product you're actually building, right? And you wanna find CMs that specialize in building that type of product. Now the typical, you know, type product categories are consumer, A and D, which is aerospace and defense or military, medical, and automotive. So if you have a consumer product, you do not wanna to go to a CM that only does military products. You're going to pay extra for that military certification that you do not need. Now, there's plenty of CMs that maybe have that military designation that also do consumer products, and that's fine. Um, but you just wanna make sure that you're a good fit, right? That they do products similar to yours. If you have kind of a product that's maybe similar to some other things on the market as far as from an assembly perspective, maybe not a function, right? Finding CMs that do products like that is gonna be helpful because they already have that experience and you're benefiting off of the fact that they've done products like this for other customers. Now, if your product's completely unique, that's totally fine as well. You're gonna be able to find a CM that's gonna be able to do it, but ask what kind of products they do. Ask, especially if it's a top level build, right? Try to figure out what type of things they do. They might not be able to give you that many specifics because they have NDAs with their customers. They're not gonna be able to give you product names or customer names potentially, but they might be able to tell you, oh yeah, we do enclosures that have a similar level of complexity, right? So make sure that you're really f making sure that that fit is right from a product type perspective, um, because if you're trying to fit a, a consumer product into a medical facility, you're, you're gonna be paying extra for no reason. Now, if you do need those medical certifications, make sure you're being very clear up front with that CM that you need certain certifications, right? Kind of like we talked about on the last slide. Um, but you want that you want to make sure that they have those classifications, even if you maybe you're unsure if you need them. That way you don't get too far down the rabbit hole and go, oh, actually I do need them, but this CM doesn't have them. They're not gonna get them just for you. It's a lengthy, expensive process. Um, so I just like to ask what they have. That way you know what they're capable of as well as what types of products they typically build, right? And it's probably gonna be all over the map, but if you explain your product to them, they might be able to go, oh, we have some products that are, that are similar to that from a assembly perspective, right? So next is what level of volume does that CM specialize in? So there's CMs that are strictly high volume only shops, right? There's ones that have that low to mid volume, there's ones that do just quick term prototypes or do quick term prototypes all the way to low to mid volume, right? I think the amount of different combinations is probably endless. So understand what level of product or level volume that CM specializes in and make sure that your volume currently and in the near future is gonna fit that, right? If you're looking to get some low volume stuff to really test the market before you go and pull the trigger on some some high volume stuff, you're not gonna be able to get into a high volume CM. They're not gonna stop the line for you for a thousand units. So make sure you understand what their kind of minimum volume is that they need and what their maximum is. And if you outgrow that CM and you're now going past what their max volume that they like doing is, they will let you know. They're gonna appreciate the fact that you were their customer they're going to make sure you have all of your documents, your DFM, maybe pass along any, you know, anything they've noticed that's helped them build your product. And they probably are gonna have some CMs that they're gonna recommend to you as well for higher volume stuff. So when you outgrow a CM, 
and you're taking up too much of their line, they're more than happy to let you go. They're not going to try to hold on to you because you're now probably their only customer, right? They need to service multiple customers in order to make ends meet. Um, so they're going to, they're going to let you go. They're going to make sure that you're set up to go to your next production facility, but that's going to take a pretty long time to probably grow out of what they can do. Right. So just make sure that you're being realistic and not being over ambitious with, Hey, we're going to do, you know, half a million units next year. If you don't necessarily have that data to back that up, um, cause you're going to go get quoted half a million units and then they're not going to do, you know, a fraction of that. They're going to want that half a million units. So it's a hard kind of predictor, but try to figure out what generally your volume is going to look like currently and find a CM that fits that volume, but also gives you some ability to grow. You don't want to start somewhere where you're at their max volume. Right. Another good kind of criteria is do they offer quick turn as well as production? So do you want to do your prototypes and your production in the same facility? One, this is not always possible. And there's some disadvantages and advantages of doing this, right? So some of the advantages is you learn a lot from that prototyping process. And so to have it done under the same roof that's going to do the production can be a big advantage of learning from all of that. And now you're not having to learn all of it again, right? However, a lot of production CMs do not do quick turn well. There's always, you know, exemptions to that. But most of the time, if you're looking for true quick turn prototyping, you're going to need to go to a quick turn prototyping shop in order to have it truly be quick. Most production CMs kind of work at a different speed than quick turn shops. And some of them are not going to want to do low volume. They're not going to have the capability of doing those low volume, let alone doing them quick. So it's not necessarily a criteria that has to be met. Um, I would just make sure that you know what you want. And it's just a question to ask, right? Is if they, can they do those quick turn prototypes for you? Right? Maybe if they're making your product now and you need some prototypes for your next generation, are they able to do that? That way, you know, it's all under the same roof. Even if it's not your initial prototypes, can they do them down the line? So it's just good to understand. Next is, do you have manufacturing experts on your team? Or do you need a partner or a CM that can help you navigate that manufacturing process? And this is what I specifically do at Arrow is try to be that extension of your team and help you with that manufacturing. But there's plenty of CMs and there's plenty of other companies that also provide similar services, right? So do you need someone to help you navigate that manufacturing because you've got no manufacturing experience and you don't really have the resources to add a, manu some, a manufacturing expert directly on your team, right? So having a partner that has those manufacturing experts, it's kind of like having an extension of your team, right? So really, is that something to think about for you of, hey, you know what, I've been in manufacturing, I understand how it works, I can manage it, or I'm brand new at manufacturing, I don't know what to look for, right? Um, not having a partner that can have like a program manager that really helps you out is something that's important, right? Next is where are they located, right? From a geography perspective, are they close to your team? Are they far away? And from a cost geography perspective, are they in a high cost geography like the US or are they in a low cost geography like Asia or Malaysia or Vietnam or Mexico? Um, so really understanding where those are um, is important. There's benefits I think to all of those different things but um, the next one is kind of do they have multiple locations and this is my ideal state for a CM I guess for production. Um, and what I mean by this is, do they have a location that's local to you, right? Whether you're in the US, Canada, Europe, Africa, doesn't matter. Do they have a, do you have a CM that's local to you that has a sister or mirror facility in a low cost geography? So that means that they can do the first articles and the first couple runs local to you, where it's a lot closer to your time zone. It's a much more manageable fight away and potentially have, you know, a, a common language. And then once your product is good, everything's running well, they have the manufacturing process set, they can then go and transfer it to their, to their facility that they have in a China or Malaysia or Vietnam, somewhere that is a lower cost to you. This is ideal for me. There's 
it's not always going to be possible, especially depending on where you live. Um, but this is something that is a big bonus for me if, if a CM has this, because this really helps you um, in the beginning phases of it. And it also really reduces your cost from a travel perspective. You might pay a little bit more for those unit, those first units that come out of your local CM, um, but you're not having to travel to, to Asia. You're not having to stay up late to try to get on the same time zone, right? If you're trying to work out engineering questions and you're, you know, from the US to, to Asia, there's a, at least a 24 hour delay in any question back and forth because of the time difference, right? So really understanding that piece of it, even if you have to pay a little bit more upfront, really looking at the cost benefit, that's what I recommend if you can, if you can find it. Again, it's not always possible, um, but the location is important. So if you aren't able to find someone that is local to you that does have that sister or mirror facility, um, where are they located? Are you able to go visit? What does that plane trip look like? How much is it going to cost you? How long is it going to take? Right. Um, things like that are important because you want to know who you're getting into business with, right? And if you're not able to, and again, this is all pre-COVID, I think right now we're all kind of shut down, right? Um, but if you're not able to go visit that facility at all, um, that can, it, it can hinder maybe that relationship as well. So understanding where they're located and how close they are to your team um, can maybe outweigh some of the cost savings of going a little farther. So just make sure you try to find a nice balance that works for you. Next, we have the certification requirements. So what requirements do you and your product have for certification? Making sure that that CM has those matching requirements. Right, I kind of mentioned it earlier, I think of the, the first bullet, but if you are building a product that is potentially a medical product, right? Maybe it's something that goes into a nurse's station at a hospital and isn't something that's patient facing. And you don't know if you need medical certifications or not for it. I would still recommend making sure you go to a CM that has the possible capability of doing medical as well as consumer. That way, if you find out you do need to have FDA approval or any kind of local you know, health organization approval, and you need to go into a certain medical like ISO 13485, for example, you have that capability in the same facility. You don't have to go start over from scratch. So understanding what requirements you have and what the CM have at the very beginning is really important. It's also important to understand what the CM's capacity is. How many lines do they have? How many units do they get out a week, a month, a year, quarterly? Kind of that information. And how quickly can they turn product if needed? So if you have a thousand piece order and you need to try to get a hundred pieces as quick as possible, do they have the capability to pull those in? At a cost, of course, but do they even have the, the capability of doing that for you? You might not think you need it, but it might be important later on when maybe you were delayed because of parts and you need 100 units quickly, but you want to do them all from the same shop. So understanding that capacity and how quickly they can turn something is crucial. So lastly on the slide, I'm going to go to this triangle that I've kind of been ignoring. This is one of my favorite kind of visuals for describing what, what you need to ask for at a CM. So I'm sure my customers are very tired of hearing this from me because I probably tell it too much, but it's my absolute favorite. So you have this triangle with speed, cost, and quality at one of each of the points, right? For your products, you can only pick two of them. I'm sure maybe there's some seam out there that you can pick three, but if you guys have one, let me know because I've yet to find one, right? So if you want something fast and you want it done well, it's gonna come at a cost. And vice versa, if you want something done well and you want it as cheap as possible, the speed is going to be sacrificed. For me personally, quality is always one of the two I pick. So really the question comes down to what's more important to you, the speed or the cost. And giving the CM this information, even if you don't necessarily have a target cost or a target turn time, is going to be helpful in the quoting phase because they're, they're going to, it's going to better understand what your need is. So even if you don't know what your target costs are, or you don't know when you're going to need product, if you, go, if you are able to tell them, hey, cost isn't the most important thing for me. I need this, you know, as cheap as I can get it. Again, with quality, right? But 
they're going to be able to go, okay, we're going to sharpen our pencil. We're going to try to go find maybe components that have longer lead times that are cheaper, things like that. We're going to give them our slowest manufacturing turn versus if you go in and say, hey, I need this as fast as you can get it to me, right? They're going to go in, they're going to find whatever components from reputable sources are available. They're not going to waste the time to try to find the one that's three cents cheaper, right? they're going to give you their fastest manufacturing turn, their fastest PCB turn, and they're gonna give it, they're gonna give you your quote for speed in mind, right? So it's crucial to understand what you need and that need can change. Right now it might be cost, and then three months down the line, you might need it quickly. Um, so just understand that even if you just give them that general direction, it helps a lot, especially, this is I think especially crucial in prototyping, um, but I think it also, it, um, also is relevant in production. Right, because if you need things quickly in production, you need to be able to schedule those out and have components and things ready. CM needs to know that. So, so that is it for the common CM criteria. Um, and then we're gonna go into our last slide, which is common obstacles. And some of this, I'm gonna sound like I'm repeating myself, um, but there are things that you can run into that we may have already touched on, but I'm gonna kind of look at it from a different lens, right? So again, that competency fit that product type and volume requirements. If you are trying to fit a square peg into a round hole, it's not gonna be good for you or the CM. So understand what your requirements are first, and that way you can go to a CM and understand what their specialty is, what, they, what their bread and butter is, what they do every day, right? You don't want to try to have someone, you know, reinvent the wheel for your product because there is a CM out there that already is a good fit for you, right? So don't try to force something in somewhere um, that it doesn't make sense. Next is cost. So something we haven't really spoken about is component buying power, right? What kind of component buying power does the CM have? Are they gonna, just gonna go to DigiKey or Arrow or Mauser and buy it as the same price as you can and then mark it up? as you know, a burden fee for going and purchasing it and handling it for you? Um, or are they going to, do they have relationships with suppliers that they're gonna be able to go get a cost that you can't go get in the open market? Um, this is where someone like an arrow can help, right? We have that component buying power, but there's also plenty of CMs that also have component buying power. So if you are going to a, a CM that maybe doesn't have a great component buying power, maybe they're a low volume shop, but they really fit you, Right. You can also look at if they can allow, you know, customer owned product, which is COP parts. Maybe you go buy some high, high dollar parts and you consign them to the CM for the build. That way you're not getting a markup on, you know, a $75 part. You know, a markup on a one set capacitor or resistor isn't really going to be the end of the world. But on some larger parts, it absolutely can make a difference. So just understanding how they buy components and what their, that power is they have can help you make best, better decisions on your end. So also understanding the difference between prototyping, low volume, and run rate pricing. The common mistake I see is someone will get production run rate pricing for tens of thousands of units or maybe even 5,000 units, right? They'll use that pricing to price their, their product to their end customer. Right, maybe it's for Indiegogo and you're you know, raising funds on pre-orders or it's, you know, you're just trying to understand a price to put it on your own website. Um, and then you get, you know, let's say 100, order, 100 units that you need and you go try to place those for 100 units. Well, you didn't get pricing for 100 units, you got pricing for 5,000 units, right? So understanding the difference between those two and how that's gonna affect you from not only a, the assembly, labor is going to go up, right, your labor costs, but your component costs, because at first you were buying components for 5,000 units, and now it's only for 100, so you're going to be buying a lot of cut tape and things like that. So make sure that you're utilizing the right pricing for the right things, um, as well as prototyping. I see it a lot of people thinking prototyping is going to be only a couple dollars more than their production pricing, and that's not the case, especially if you're trying to go quick and you're trying to go at local to you. Um, you're going to see double, triple, quadruple your pricing, depending on your product, and depending on how quickly you need it. So understand those differences and 
understand what you're using those pricing that pricing for and that I think it's safer to go with your low volume pricing if you're trying to price out your product to your end customer and then you can always have a price reduction if you are able to get you know some higher volume pricing but so and then you also have speed um, I know we've already kind of touched on that but knowledge around what the CM standard speed is and what speed you need so if their standard turn is eight weeks and you need something monthly, you need to make sure they're gonna be able to support that. And they might be able to, right? If you're able to give them an order for a full quarter and they can deliver monthly for you, they might be able to do that, but just understand what their standard is, right? They have a standard way of operating and a standard you know, business practices. They can be flexible and fit you potentially, um, but you can't ask them to be flexible on everything, right? So knowing what their standards are will help you determine if they're the right fit for you. Again, if they're a fit everywhere else and there's one thing that maybe is not the best fit, you might be able to come to some sort of compromise on that. Um, but just understanding that they're not going to be able just to change the way they do business just for you, right? They've got other customers, they've got, you know, their directives and their goals they're trying to hit. They have to do what's best for, for them as well, while also making sure that they're providing quality product for you. So the last thing is obviously very new to all of us, um, but I think it's a, if you do not have a CM yet, I think it's a great question to ask, is understanding that essential business distinction and if that CM had it, um, and ask the question, hey, how did you handle COVID-19? Did you have an essential business distinction? Were you in a country that even allowed that, right? What type of scheduling did you have? What was your capacity, right? Did you have split shifts? And were you at 50% capacity? What was your contingency plan? Um, having that distinction of essential business can absolutely be a competitive advantage. However, not all countries had that, right? I know in the US we had essential business distinctions and I also know that our facility that we use in Malaysia got shut down, right? Even if, though, if they were in the US, they would have been considered an essential business. So make sure you understand not only what that essential business distinction means for you, but also for the country that you're that you're manufacturing in if it's not the country you live in, right? And then just ask how they handled it. Ask what problems they faced. I mean, this was new for everybody and we, I don't think anyone probably handled it perfectly, but you can see how they were able to adapt. Um, and that kind of can show you a lot about how, what type of CM they are, right? If they were able to adapt and protect their employees, but still keep, keep things flowing through. Um, would your product have been safe there? Things like that. And would you have still gotten product during that time? I think it's some important questions to ask um, in our current climate. So with that, um, I think we're gonna open up to questions, but if you do have any other, um, if you wanna learn any more about Arrow's manufacturing, you can go to arrow.com slash manufacturing. Um, and then I think Brittany maybe can speak a little more about the Arrow certification program. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So like I said at the top, uh, the Aero Certification Program is Aero and Indiegogo's initiative to help you with all of these things, prototyping, sourcing components, manufacturing challenges. The program is free and we offer one-on-one -on -one, um, engineering reviews and manufacturing consultations with people like Taylor and um, other people on Aero's team of experts, as well as discounts on components from Aero.com, things like that. Um, all right, so thank you so much, Taylor, for running us through those slides. That was super informative. Uh, we do have a couple of questions here for the next 15 minutes or so. Um, all right, so diving right in. First question for you, Taylor. How can we check if the manufacturer has a good or bad record? What indicators should we look out for and kind of take cue from? Yeah, so you should ask for their QMS or QMP, which is your their quality management system or quality management plan. And they could also call it something else, but this is what they're audited against to keep their, you know, if they're ISO certified or whatever certifications they have. So this is where you're gonna see things like their first pass yield, their on-time delivery, all of those quality metrics, you're gonna see right there. And this is, again, what they're audited against. So auditors will come in once a year, couple times a year, every other year, kind of depending on the certification. And they'll make sure that these things are accurate and that they're following their work instructions the way they're supposed to, that their operators know where to find these work instructions, things like that. So this is something that they could risk, you know, losing their 
their certification if they don't upkeep. So they should have something that shows you these things. And it's a good way just to understand if they have high fallout um, or if they don't have a quality management system, that should be a red flag for you. Um, if you are able to visit, which again, I know I've said it a bunch, but right now it might not be possible, but if you are able to visit, really look at the manufacturing floor. Um, so there's something in lean manufacturing called 5S, which is now turned into 6S, right, which um, is a lean manufacturing system for, um, it's, the S's are sort, set in place, um, standardize, sustain, and shine, and then now the 6S is safety. Um, and these are something that really help keep a, some, a place organized and keep a flow in the process. So you can look for these things without having any idea what any of those S's that I just said stand for. Um, and it's things like, are things organized and labeled? Does everything have a spot? Um, can you tell like what order that the operator is working on? Like, is there obviously signs and that this is one order or that if there are multiple orders, they're definitely separated. Um, is there a layer of dust on everything or is it clean? Is there junk all over the floor or is it pretty tidy? Again, if you're looking at someone in the middle of their workday, there might be some things here and there out of place, right? But in general, can you tell that the place has been dusted in the last year, right? Um, is something also really good to look for if you are able to visit. Awesome, awesome. All right, next question. There's kind of two questions that kind of tie into each other, so I'll read both of them. Okay. Does, a, does a patent pending protect the company from manufacturers who copy designs of original products? And then along those lines, how can I prevent a manufacturer from copying my product and selling it online? Yeah, so first I'm gonna say, make sure you're consulting a patent lawyer or patent experts, because I am by far that. Um, but I think a good way to kind of look at this is in theory, yes, your patent should protect um, your company from someone copying your design. Now make sure that your patent is also covered in the country that you're manufacturing in. If you've got a patent in the US, I don't know for sure that it goes and covers that in China, right? So if you are getting something produced in China, I don't know if you're covered even with your US patent. Now, if you do have a patent in both places, there always is risk that someone's gonna break the law, right, and steal your product. So that's why I think making sure you're work, working with a reputable contract manufacturer um, is also very important, but understand what is your responsibility to patent and what is the CM's responsibility, right? So you need to make sure your IP and your product design and all of that is you know, owned by you and patented by you, right? Now, the CM's process and their manufacturing process is theirs. That's their intellectual property. They don't have to give that to you at all. So, because if they run the same risk of you going and then selling their, you know, processes to someone else. So just understand what is your responsibility. And again, that's where working with someone that is much more in that world than me is helpful, um, but also not, you know, not expecting to get the, the actual manufacturing process of your product patented. Um, also make sure you have NDAs and contracts and things like that to protect you. Um, but this is where making sure you have some legal advice on how to best do that. If you don't live where your manufacturing is being done is, is really crucial. And then as far as, you know, again, that copying and selling, selling, you know, selling your design, um, hopefully you don't run into a problem like that. If you're really worried about from a software perspective, there are some ways of, you know, you can maybe get your product programmed domestically to wherever you're at um, and then provide that programmed part to the CM just to place. That way they have no way of actually getting into your product to, to see it. Um, but they just have the, the design on the outside, but without your software, hopefully that's not something that they can go do, right? Um, so that's one way to maybe protect yourself. But again, I think the best, best way to protect yourself is really do your research on that CM and make sure that you're getting, you know, legal advice on how to best protect yourself. Got it. Got it. All right. Next question here. Is it appropriate to request samples of similar product work when reviewing and choosing manufacturers? Um, potentially. So I think it's always appropriate to ask this, but understand that the CM might not be able to give you it. So they have NDAs with their customers, they have got contracts with their other customers. 
and you know kind of look at on the flip side of if this was your product would you want samples being sent out so some SAMs might have agreements with certain customers that they're able to at least maybe give you a high level of their their product or examples um, but some SAMs might not be able to do this so I think it's always fine to ask but understand if it might not be enough it might be a no okay uh, next question here. How can I be sure that the manufacturer will use the manufacturing material as agreed upon and not cheaper ones? So a reputable CM is going to build to only your build docs. They're not going to go off script at all. If there is an alternative needed, let's say they can't source, you know, what you have on your bomb or that's on end of life, they're going to either one, provide an alternative and ask for your approval or two, they're going to come to you and say, hey, this is out of stock, we need an alternative for this. Um, they're never just gonna go find something else and, and, and use it. Um, there are some CMs that will use their stock resistors and capacitors unless otherwise stated, but that's gonna be shown on their quote. So if you say, nope, I want you to only use my bomb, they're only gonna use your bomb, okay? Um, so one risk though that I think is still there even if they are using your bomb, and I've actually seen happen personally, is buying from a broker instead of an approved source. So not that I'm saying brokers are bad, but there could be issues that arise that the CM isn't aware about. So kind of the example I have is we were building a product and there was one part that our CM sourced from a broker without our, us knowing and it ended up being four years old. Turns out about two years ago, they did a firmware update. The supplier did a firmware update on this part, which completely changed the way the part interacts and my customer needed the part two years old or newer. We weren't told about this. The supplier didn't make any change to the part number, so it's the same part number. So the CM worked with someone they always work with and bought a part, right, that ended up making the product basically completely useless. We were able to flash it and get the firmware updated. Um, but that's something that I think to make sure that you bring up that my recommendation is if the CM wants to buy from anywhere but you know, approved reputable sources that they just get approval first from you because it might not matter for that one part, but it could matter for something else. Okay. Um, it looks like the, we're getting a bunch of questions here about like, what is the best place to search for a contract manager? Is it just kind of via online searches? Is there a comprehensive directory or list that you recommend? Where do people um, start? Well, I think starting through kind of a certification program could like what Arrow and Indiegogo were doing could help because then you can have some people that are directing you to contract manufacturers that are in your area or that they've worked with and kind of vetted out themselves. But if you're trying to kind of go for your own kind of search, um, honestly, online is the best way to start. Um, I only work with manufacturers that Arrow has gone embedded that were kind of before I even kind of took over. So I'm not great in the going out and trying to find kind of cold calling and trying to find contract manufacturers. Um, but I would look for maybe some in your area first, just to kind of get an idea of what's out there close to you. Because I think the, the, a lot of people's instinct is to go immediately to China, right? Immediately to a low cost geography. So I look and see what's in your local area and see if you can go visit some CMs to kind of just get an understanding of what's around you and what those CMs look like um, and let them quote your product and see what that looks like. Um, and that way, hopefully you maybe have a community around you, you can ask about them too, right? If someone has experience with them or you might be able to find out more information than trying to go somewhere like an overseas country that you've never been to, um, to try to find a CM out of a whole list of CMs. But, um, yeah, it's, I don't think there's a perfect way to go start trying to find a manufacturer. I would start trying online and trying locally to you and kind of seeing what to come up with or go through a program like Arrow has um, and they can connect you with some, with some CMs um, in your area. Awesome. That's a good segue for our next question, actually. Uh, there's a couple of questions here about your team at Arrow Electronics and how it works. So maybe you can talk a little bit about what you guys do if somebody mm -hmm. were to sign up for the certification program and have that manufacturing consultation with you like what would that look like um, mm -hmm. and there's a question here is arrow a CM service itself or something different so we act as a general contractor so 
once you have that manufacturing consultation with most likely me um, and you have your design files ready and you want to quote and we've got an NDA in place and everything, you'll send those files over and we'll kind of discuss your requirements. A lot of the things we talked about today of, hey, is speed the issue, is cost the issue, um, what geography, like what location do you need this in? Um, so we do not do any of the manufacturing ourselves. We have a network of partners that do the manufacturing for us. And this allows us to have the ability to do a slew of different things that if we just had one facility, we couldn't, we could not service all of our customers. So Arrow's big enough. If we'd want, if we wanted to, to do that, we absolutely could. So we have partners that we've gone in and audited that we continue to audit, um, that we vetted out and, and gone through all of those steps from a prototyping and a production standpoint, and ones that are kind of in the middle that will do both for us. Um, so we'll take your, your product, we'll take your project, we'll understand what your requirements are, and we'll reach out and we'll quote maybe two to three CMs, depending on, depending on what it is. Um, maybe one if it really fits with one CM only. Um, and we'll come back and then we'll quote you that. And let's say you want to move forward with us. Um, and this is mainly for prototyping. I would be your project manager and I would run that project for you. So I'm going to be the one that is in contact with the CM. Um, we'll absolutely let you know who that CM is. You can go visit that CM if you want. We can have kickoff calls with them. You can be as involved or uninvolved as you want. Um, but I'm going to be the one that's going to handle the little things that come up in manufacturing and only get you involved if I need an approval for a new product or if I need, you know, something like, hey, here's an issue that came up that I've tried to fix and I, I need some guidance on. Um, but I'm going to be the one that's going to take the brunt of communicating with Sam, getting those updates for you. That way, you're not trying to chase down who at the CM can provide this update, who can provide this update, things like that. You're going to have a single point of contact with me, and then I'm going to go run that project for you and kind of be that manufacturing person on your team. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Taylor, for your time today. This was super informative. Uh, everyone, if we weren't able to get to your questions, there were a few questions that were maybe a little too uh, specific for the general audience, um, definitely check out the Aero Certification Program. You can get that free manufacturing consultation with an expert at Aero on Taylor's team. Uh, to join, just visit our landing page, enterprise.indiegogo.com slash Aero. And we'll be also sending that link out in an email after this. All you have to do is, send, is fill out a quick form uh, and then someone from Aero will be in touch with you uh, to get your questions answered. All right. Uh, thank you again, Taylor. And thank you everyone for attending our webinar today. We will see you next time. Bye everyone. Bye Taylor. Thanks Brittany.